Hi, welcome to the demonstration of the Crooks radiometer. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this video is because one of my Patreon members sent me a video by Ken Wheeler where Ken Wheeler explains how uh, he thinks this radiometer works. And to be honest with you, I think Ken Wheeler's explanation is correct. Uh, now, I don't always agree with Ken Wheeler's stuff. I think he uses a lot of extra words where fewer words could be used. And I'm not really sure what his model of magnetism is because he presents no mathematical models. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're going to talk about and show the experiment that Ken Wheeler does and explain why Ken Wheeler has come, what I think he's come to the right conclusion. Okay, and so what Ken Wheeler does is he has multiple little LED emitters. That's not really the best way to do it. I'm going to show you with a little more powerful flashlight that the blue light uh, is more efficient at spinning this radiometer than red light. Now what he says is he says red light doesn't do a thing. That's not 100% correct, but that doesn't really, dis dis is not discordant with his theory anyway. There it goes. It is making it spin. Okay. So, I mean, he says red light won't make it spin. Eh. Red light, if it's bright enough, will allow it to spin. Okay, now if I change this, let me just stop it and start it again. It's just hard to get started with red light. Oh, here comes the supervisor. Hey, uh, dude, I'm in the middle of something here. Do you mind? Thank you. There we go. So he says with red light it won't spin, and this here shows that's not correct, but that doesn't, that's not, does not defeat what his theory is. Okay, red light will make it spin, but it's spin, it's almost doesn't even want to spin, but bright enough red light will in fact make it spin. Okay, he was just using little LED emitters, so obviously, you know, the little tiny emitters, it wasn't going to spin. But now if I switch off to a green lens, which is higher frequency light. You'll see it has a little bit easier of a time to get going. Okay, and then if I switch off to blue light, it's going to spin up at a much higher velocity, a higher speed. And of course, white light, it'll just go to town on. Okay, and what I did when I was playing around with it, I decided I was going to come up with my own theory, is when my cat walked by the other time I was playing with it, he jumped up on the table and he walked around and was spinning with him. So I got my cat over here. I'm going to charge up the styrofoam ball on his coat. And let me show you something. Hold on, it's a very, no, not enough. I need more, buddy. Give me your tummy, that's the best, oh yeah, the tummy, that's the best part. There we go. And see, with that styrofoam ball, I can move it around. Okay, but what I'm saying with the electric ball is that the Coulomb forces can move this thing around. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Well, that says to me that the other theories, and I looked into other theories, let's go to the search for the other theories right now. I initially did my search for how a radiometer works from my, my engineering and science book collection here. Um, and, you know, you would expect it to be in here. I've got, like, you know, handbooks, uh, Standard electrical engineer. This is mostly electrical engineer and software on the bottom. 
but then I've got microwave engineering, antenna engineering, calculus, uh, probability theory, the whole nine yards. Then when you get up to this, this is more physics shelf. Okay, I didn't find any mention of a radiometer at all in quantum mechanics book. Not one of these books has any reference to um, radiometers at all. And here's the, the Treasury of Physics, Astronomy, Mathematics. Not one mention of a radiometer in there. Uh, not in quantum electrodynamics. We go up one. Oh, by the way, these four books on the outside are books I just purchased. Uh, this one looks like interesting, How to Build a Proton Precession Magnetometer. That looks pretty interesting. We're going to get to that in probably about a year or so. Um, the Big Bang Never Happened. Anxious to read that one. The Higgs Fake, How the Particle Physics Fooled the Nobel Prize Committee by Alexander Unzicker. And this is the other book that I have for Halt and Arp, which is the Catalog of Discord and Redshift. But anyway, in here, behind all this, these are basically electrical engineering, microwave, induction heating, blah, blah, blah. Nothing in there. Uh, nothing up here. This, is, again, is a mixture of software and C-sharp and all that stuff. And over here, here is my physics textbook that I pulled out. Not one mention of a radiometer at all. And the so-called concise Encyclopedia of Science and Technology. Not a mention of a radiometer at all. All, at least not a hook's radiometer or crook's radiometer. Um, the only place I could find the explanation of the radiometer was on a wiki page. The only is that it is the slight amount of air inside the vesicle that's getting heated more on the black side and so what you have is a difference in pressure of air pressure of heated pressure. This, this would be the way that a Stirling engine would work. Okay so getting back the only theories that I found on how this works online, other than Ken Wheeler's, was they said that it was the heating of the black side different than the heating on the white side. And basically that's causing more air energy or pressure up against the black side than the white side. So essentially what they're saying is, is that this works very similarly to a Stirling engine. Which, you know, that's actually a fair uh, explanation of how this works. But here's where the problem is, is that when we put red light, now the Stirling engine would work on heat. Thermal radiation is very long wave radiation, much, much longer than red. It is into the infrared and beyond and lower in frequency. But what we've seen is that red light barely makes this thing turn compared to blue light. Now blue light is up near the ultraviolet range. Ultraviolet is more higher energy uh, wavelength or shorter wavelength which is a higher energy per unit wavelength and this higher frequency light is more able to knock electrons out of orbit and therefore if it were thermal energy this should work better under red than it should under blue okay but if it's ionic propulsion because anything above blue light you know, ultraviolet and above is considered ionizing radiation which would be knocking electrons off and that means that the spray of electrons coming off the black side is more than any electrons being knocked off the white side. And basically that would mean this is ionic propulsion. And that's what Ken Wheeler means when he says this is the photoelectric effect. Okay, that's what he's saying because that photoelectric effect is the effect where you can knock electrons off of something using light. That's basically what it is. Which you know, putting a little finer point on it than Ken, because it, for the average person may not know what how the photoelectric effect works, that if you could bounce more electrons off of one side than the other, you would have a net pressure from electrons ex exiting, and therefore this would work. But again, bouncing, getting electrons to leave something works better at higher frequency light than it does for lower frequency light. And so that would add corroboration to Ken Wheeler's understanding of this, that this works by basically the photoelectric effect rather than what they say on Wikipedia, which is the thermal uh, difference in energy, which would be more in the infrared range. Okay, so I'm going to say that for the most part I'm agreeing with Ken Wheeler, but we need to do more than this. What we really need to do, if it is a photoelectric effect, it should work in a pure vacuum. I always thought this was supposed to be a vacuum in here, but from what I understand it's not a pure vacuum. 
So it's like if it works because of the Stirling engine effect, why put a vacuum in here at all, even if it's partial? You would think with a if we crack this open, let the air inside, that it should work better. Okay, if it is a Stirling engine phenomenon. Because the more air you have, the more efficient, the, the, unless, of course, the, the, it's viscosity that the air might slow it down. That's a possibility. Okay, but if we put it in a pure vacuum, and Ken Wheeler is right, this should work in a complete vacuum. So what I'm putting in my, my uh, shopping cart at Amazon.com is a vacuum pump and a bell jar. Because what we're going to do is we're going to break, and I'm going to buy another one of these so I can break this one. And we're going to break it open and expose it to the air and see if it works in the air. And then we're going to put it in the bell jar and we're going to do a high vacuum pump of that bell jar and see, you know, does it, does it still work under a complete vacuum? If it works under a complete vacuum, then the photoelectric effect is the proper explanation. It'd be ion propulsion. So in that regard, it's, it's not new. NASA has been experiencing with ion propulsion for a while now, but it's not a very efficient propulsion system. But let's just go there anyway, just to verify if Ken Wheeler is right or not. Okay, we have to. We just can't sit there and say this is the theory and not doing anything to try to prove it. Especially since the Stirling engine is, is compelling, but Ken Wheeler's idea of using differently frequencies of light kind of add corroboration that, that doesn't seem likely because, you know, like I said, if it were thermal, it would be a much lower frequency. This, would, this should work with red light better than it works with blue light if it were the Stirling engine effect. If it works better with blue light than red light, it's more along the lines that it must be something with ionic propulsion. Now, it could also be a combination of the two. Okay, we need to, we need to, uh, we, we actually need to go further with this experiment and actually put it in a full vacuum and then alternatively put it into full air and see how it, how it, uh, how it performs. So, okay, you know, I'm the kind of guy that will give credit where credit is due. And I think Ken, uh, I came to the same conclusion doing his experiment. It said it's got to be the photoelectric effect. And I looked around and no one else has this explanation. And so, yep, Ken Wheeler is the first guy to ever properly explain this if we can prove it with the bell jar and put it in a pure vacuum and if it still works in a pure vacuum. Well, it doesn't even have to be a pure vacuum. It just has to work equally well in a better vacuum than what's in here. And I don't know what the vacuum in here is. Okay, so that's where we are with this. This is another one of a million experiments I'm going to have on my backlog. We'll probably not get to this until the summer. Um, I've got other experiments I need to do, but this is in our pipeline. Anyway, thank you very much.